join with me in a spirit of prayer. Holy and loving, good and gracious God, we pray this morning that you would speak to us a word of truth, a word of hope, and a word of love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, 2020. I think we all can agree that as far as years in life go, this one has been a bit of a, how do you say, uh, dumpster fire. This has been a dumpster fire of a year so far. We kicked off the year, remember, with wildfires ripping across Australia, destroying thousands of homes and millions of acres of animal habitat. Our beloved Harry and Meghan stepped down from the royal family. Our president was impeached. Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter crash. The Boy Scouts of America went bankrupt. Folks on the West Coast were inundated by quote-unquote murder hornets. And then we had weeks and weeks of protests and civil unrest in the wake of the police murder of George Floyd. And of course, of course, it unfortunately cannot go without saying that since February, we have been going toe-to-toe with the coronavirus, which has already claimed more than 800,000 lives across the globe and has left our economy in shambles. Tens of millions of Americans have lost their jobs, and many of those are right now wondering how they're going to keep the roof over their heads as eviction moratoriums across the country continue to expire state by state. Like I said, 2020 has been a dumpster fire of a year. And standing as we are in a year like this one, the story we find this morning in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, becomes all the more poignant for us. And I say that because in today's story, we get to see how Jesus himself responds to a significant loss in his life. That is, we get to see how Jesus himself undertakes the grieving process. And this is important to us because whether you lost a loved one to COVID or a job or have simply lost life as you once knew it to be, right now, the whole people of God, the world over, are carrying around with us a lot, a lot, a lot of grief. And quite frankly, all of us could use a healthy model for how to handle all of this loss that we're experiencing. In this morning's story, I believe we find just that. We find a model of grief that, it, that is humane, that is balanced, and ultimately a model of grief that is grounded in community. So our story opens with the followers of John the Baptist coming to Jesus in order to inform him of John's tragic death. John the Baptist, of course, was not only the cousin of Jesus, but he was also his friend and his spiritual precursor. It was John, remember, who had the honor of baptizing Jesus in the Jordan River. Now, what had happened to John is that he had spoken a little bit too much truth to power. Specifically, he had criticized King Herod for divorcing his wife and then unlawfully marrying his brother's sister. Which, if you're wondering, was just as Jerry Springery back then as it would be today. In any case, in response to being publicly called out on this matter, King Herod had John the Baptist beheaded. So the followers of John, John's disciples, they come to Jesus in this morning story in order to break to him this terrible, terrible news. Upon learning of his cousin's death, Jesus immediately jumps into a boat and heads off to a remote area just to be alone. Just to be by himself for a while and out of the public eye. Now, when I say that the model for grief that we find in this story today is a humane one, this is the part of the story that I'm talking about. Because what we have here is Jesus himself, Son of God, the way, the truth, the light, love made flesh. What we have here is Jesus himself, upon hearing about the death of someone he loves dearly, he doesn't try to just tamp down or suppress those emotions. He doesn't just man up 
He doesn't just cowboy up or feel free to insert whatever phrase you want to use to describe the process of swallowing your emotions. No, Jesus is feeling some things. And of course he is. He has just lost someone that is so, so dear to him. So he heads off to be by himself and feel those feelings fully. Jesus is human, and he is having human emotions. And what's more, he is honoring those emotions. While we're not told in great detail about what specifically Jesus felt in this moment, we do know that elsewhere in Scripture he cries openly when he's told about the death of another friend. And elsewhere yet, he describes his own sadness by saying, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. So all of this is to say that in the face of great loss, even the Son of God allowed himself to feel the full emotional weight of it. He allowed himself to be sad, to admit that this thing that he is going through is hard, that it hurts. And if that's an all right thing for God to do, uh, I think it's safe to conjecture that that's an all right thing for us to do too. Like I said, this is a profoundly humane model of grief, a model that honors our very human emotional life. At the same time, though, this model of grief that Jesus is demonstrating is also a balanced one. So Jesus is heading off to an isolated place in the wilderness to just be alone and and to process. Unfortunately, though, his time working through his feelings is not quite as long as he hoped it would be. In fact, it lasts only the length of his boat ride because those crowds that had, were continually swarming around him, they had gotten wind of where he was headed, and so they set off there on foot. And much to Jesus' chagrin, they were actually sitting there waiting for him when his boat landed on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And sad and grieving though he was, Jesus couldn't help but take note of the need before him. He saw the sick and the ailing among their numbers. He had compassion for them, and so he healed them. Moreover, when it was getting on in the day, and the disciples informed him that the people in the crowd would have to travel considerable distances before uh, they would be back home and able to eat, Jesus was again moved with compassion. And in that most famous of miracles, he multiplies five loaves of bread and two fish, such that all 5,000 people in the crowd were able to eat and be filled. So what we see going on here is that even in the midst of his grief, Jesus still experiences a very deep calling to love and to serve his neighbors. What absolutely needs to be pointed out, though, is that Jesus doesn't seem to be performing these miracles as a way of just keeping himself busy, in order to ignore all those pesky feelings of loss and grief that he's experienced over John's death. Rather, he's just responding to the real need that he sees before him. He's attended to the needs of his own heart enough, apparently, uh, that he's now able to attend to the needs of others. Now, uh, at this point, I'm I'm hoping that all of you can recall uh, what is known as, as the Great Commandment, Uh, What is the heart of the gospel message itself? It goes, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, yeah, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So in this great commandment, which, by the way, Jesus says is the center of it all, there's this wonderful balance being struck love your neighbor as you love yourself. The assumption being that you can't love your neighbor until you love yourself. You can't take care of your neighbor until you can take care of yourself. At the same time, though, you're not loving on and taking care of yourself for narcissism's sake, but because you love God and want to be able to love and care for your neighbors. So what we're seeing in this story is is that grief and loss and hardship doesn't absolve us, ultimately, from our responsibility to care for those around us. Meaning that all the more we need to tend to the needs of our hearts so that once again we can return to our ultimate calling 
of loving and serving God and neighbor. There is a balance to the way Jesus is modeling grief for us. Balance that is grounded in that great trifold love of God and neighbor and self. And finally, we would be truly remiss if we failed to notice the thread of community that is running throughout this story in such a remarkable and beautiful way. When Jesus jumped into a boat to go off to an isolated place, do we imagine that he was rowing that boat by himself? Not at all. This is a good-sized fishing vessel that we're talking about. It would have required a number of people manning the oars in order for it to go anywhere. So, interestingly, we see that even Jesus' desire to be alone, to work out his feelings of loss, was supported and enabled by his community. Then, just like Reverend Wendy talked about in the children's sermon, when they get to where they're going and Jesus decides to re-engage the crowds, it's the disciples that pull that boat ashore. It's the disciples that tell Jesus about the people's need for food. It's the disciples that present him with the original loaves and fishes. It's the disciples that distribute the miraculously multiplied food. And it's the disciples that then pick up the leftovers when everyone had eaten 12 baskets in all. When Jesus is ready to re-engage the world, he's not doing that alone either. Again, he is surrounded and supported by those who love him. The model of grief we see Jesus living out is one embedded in, supported by, and enabled by a community. A community very much like this one that we are in, this one that we come together to create Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. So a, a lot of you, I, I think, know that over these past five years, my wife and I have been doing IVF in the hopes of having little guffers, very much like the ones that you all bring to church. Uh, in fact, it's hard to be surrounded by, by such awesome kiddos like yours and not want to have some of our own, you know? Uh, but time and again, unfortunately, our efforts have been unsuccessful. And unfortunately, the doctors have really yet to determine exactly why that is. We have what's called unexplained infertility. This past month, however, we received the first good news we've had in five years, followed shortly thereafter by the very worst news that we've had in five years. We learned that finally, at long last, the scientific process had paid off, that implanted embryo had taken hold, and that we had conceived at last we found out we were pregnant. But in fairly short order, we discovered that that pregnancy had ended in miscarriage. Many tears were shed in our household and in fact are still being shed in our household. But in all of that hurt and all of that sadness and all of that grief, one thing has become so, so clear to both of us. We would not have been able to walk this path as long as we have, which thus far has been a path of continual grief. We would not have been able to walk this path as long as we had if it wasn't for this community and if it wasn't for my wife's church community. From the first day that I opened my lips in church about all that we're going through, so many of you have shared your own experiences with infertility, have offered the hard-wrought wisdom that you have gleaned from your own journeys, and have again and again and again encouraged us and offered to hold us in your personal prayers. And we seriously would not have been able to bear it all without that support. And I share this with you simply to say that in addition to all of the public catastrophes that have added up to make 2020 the dumpster fire that it really truly is, each of us is also bearing our own individual losses and our own private tragedies on top of all those public ones. So now, more than ever, we need to do what Jesus did. We need to be real about what's going on inside of us, while at the same time not losing sight of the fact that we are ultimately made not to be inward-looking creatures, but to look outwards in love. And now, more than ever, we need to lean on the hope and the strength and the resiliency of communities just like this one. 
And friends, together, with the help and the blessing of God, we will make it through this year, and I pray, through many more. In Jesus' name, amen.